Good morning. The first item of business is general questions, and at question number one, I call Jackie Bailey to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to protect primary care services in light of reports showing the workforce and demand pressures on general practice. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. I am uh, immensely grateful to GPs and, of course, GP practice staff up and down the country who do an incredible job uh, in it during a period of significant challenge. Uh, we are absolutely, absolutely committed to ensuring that being a GP remains an attractive career choice with a manageable workload. Despite the pandemic, we have recruited 3,220 whole-time equivalent healthcare professionals to provide support to GPs, underpinned by an investment commitment of over, over £500 million since 2018. We have a record number of GPs working in Scotland and we are committed to 800 additional GPs by the end of 2027. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response, but he should know that statistics for 2022 show that the whole time equivalent number of GPs has actually fallen to 3,493. That's 81 fewer than in 2017 when the SNP announced its intention to boost GP numbers. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with Dr Andrew Buist of the BMA who says that the SNP's government's failure to boost GP numbers and provide sufficient funding has locked primary care into a vicious circle of rising workloads, forcing GPs out of the profession. Cabinet Secretary. I am sure Jackie Bailey knows, but it was maybe just an oversight, that our uh, target for between 2017 and 2027 was based on headcount numbers. And of course, overall GP headcount numbers have increased by 291, from 4,000. 918 to 5,209. So there has been an increase uh, in headcount GPs, and we're making good progress towards uh, that 800 figure. In terms of full-time equivalents, uh, the, the issue that uh, Jackie Bailey raises, of course, uh, we are engaging both with Dr Andrew Buist, who I meet very regularly, and also the RCGP and what more we can do in relation to retention. Although it should be recognised that more flexible working patterns is a good thing. It helps with that work-life balance which in itself we hope can, work, can help uh, with retention. I, I would commend the RCGP uh, report that they released uh, just before uh, Christmas, uh, focusing on a number of initiatives the government may want to explore uh, in relation to retention of GPs, and will continue to engage both with the BMA uh, and with the RCGP on these important issues. Sandish Gilhani. Announcing total funding hides the fact that the Scottish Government made cuts this year to GP and primary cares. Pressure on GPs is only going to increase, given we have 23 fewer GPs than last year. Greater Glasgow and Clyde announced yesterday they are pausing non-urgent elective surgery and going to an emergency footing, despite the money. And this is going to increase care in primary care. And also, long COVID. We heard today many people on BBC uh, Scotland Radio who are suffering and who are saying the service is failing them. A nurse we cheered and clapped for during the pandemic says she will lose her job and her home because of long COVID. If patients are saying they can't get help from hospitals, they are going to go to GP and increase pressure. What more are you willing to do to help long COVID patients? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, what I would say to Dr Sandish Gohani is, of course, he's right. We did have to make some really difficult choices around our budget uh, this year, including the reprofiling of funding from primary care. We did that, of course, because his party completely mismanaged the economy of the United Kingdom. And high inflation costs meant that our budget in health and social care portfolio was worth £650 million less than when we set it the previous December. So these difficult decisions had to be made because we don't have those full fiscal levers in our own hands. So what we will do is continue to ensure that we invest in those multidisciplinary teams. That will help to spread the workload right from, from GPs right across other members uh, of staff. We'll also continue to invest in NHS 24, for example, where people get really excellent advice. And we, I announced, of course, uh, additional uh, recruitment of 200 staffing on long COVID. Uh, he knows we have a commitment of £10 million over three uh, financial years, and we'll continue to invest in that funding to help long COVID sufferers, as well as anybody else suffering any condition at a time of great pressure on our NHS. Beatrice Wishart. A Shetland GP surgery posted on social media this week that, and I quote, due to high demand and staff availability, we are currently dealing with clinically urgent requests only. If your request is of an unurgent nature, please consider contacting us next week. What can the Scottish Government say to those seeking medical help and the staff under pressure in our island NHS services? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say that this has been and continues to be, of course, but certainly uh, has been in the last few weeks one of the most difficult periods I think the NHS has ever faced in its, its existence. And we know that as a result of the accumulative impact, of course, of the pandemic, uh, rising COVID cases. She'll know from the last ONS data that was sitting at 1 in 25 uh, when the data was released uh, on Friday. Uh, flu cases higher than they have been uh, in many, uh, many years. Uh, strep A cases uh, rising and other viral infections rising too. And all of that, uh, and then during the festive period, of course, coming at a time of, of cold snap uh, weather too. So all of these factors combining have made this uh, a really difficult period uh, for uh, the NHS and social care right up and down the country. What are we doing? I stood up uh, on Tuesday to give some detail of what we're doing to support, including, of course, uh, helping with the issues around discharge, investing further in NHS 24 service available uh, up and down uh, the country. Uh, and difficult decisions will have to be made at a local level, whether it's in NHS Shetland or elsewhere, but I hope that these difficult decisions that are being made uh, will be time limited uh, and while the support, additional support that we provided kicks in uh, and as those flu cases, COVID cases, I hope in time of course begin to abate, that helps the health service through what is a really, really difficult time and my gratitude once again to every single member of the NHS and social care working so hard during the difficult times. Question number two, Gordon MacDonald. British government, when it last met with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, I have not yet met with the current Chancellor and I did not have the opportunity to meet with either of his two predecessors. I last met the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on the 17th of November after the United Kingdom Autumn Statement. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Forecasts compiled by Consensus Economics show the UK facing the worst and longest recession in the G7. The Office for Budget Responsibility predicts that we are facing the biggest fall in living standards since record began due to inflation, and more than three quarters of members of the British Chambers of Commerce say the UK Tory Brexit deal is not helping them increase sales or grow their business. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what economic levers the Scottish Government needs in order to escape a future of Westminster failure build on Scotland's economic strengths and become as successful as comparable independent European countries. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Mr. 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 It, it, it is becoming very clear with all of the available evidence of the economic damage that is being done by the Brexit that was imposed upon Scotland by the United Kingdom Conservative Government. And the specific areas where we are suffering is obviously in relation to free trade with the European Union, where companies are suffering just now. So an independent country with the ability to rejoin the EU would be an advantage. Uh, we know from the failures of the energy market that the ability to redesign the energy market would be an important attribute for Scotland to have. Um, the ability to use employment laws to ensure fairer work would be an advantage. And crucially, the ability to have a migration policy designed to boost our working age population would be an advantage, which can only come with Scottish independence, given the hostility to such approaches by the United Kingdom Government. So I think Mr Macdonald correctly highlights the severe economic damage being undertaken by Brexit and the opportunities that Scottish independence would give to create much more fiscal flexibility yep. for the Government in Scotland. Question number three, Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its response to the Climate Change Committee's report's progress in reducing emissions in Scotland 2022 report to Parliament and Scottish emissions targets first five yearly review. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, Scottish Ministers will take the appropriate time to consider the recommendations from the Climate Change Committee's <laughs> advice and respond in the spring. We will work closely with the Climate Change Committee as part of our continuous review of policy to ensure we benefit fully from their expertise, whilst progressing delivery and considering possible new actions. Uh, the Committee's advice will also support development of the next Climate Change Plan, which will be published in full later this year. Liam Kerr. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but the Committee said that SNP targets were not accompanied by deep thinking about policies and rather accused ministers of magical thinking. Now, clearly, 
this portfolio must be prioritised. But I've discovered the Scottish Government has only six people working on its Climate Justice Fund, whilst just four are dealing with the Loss and Damage Fund announced at COP27. Compare that with the 25 civil servants working on an independence prospectus costing one and a half million a year. And this Government's skewed priorities are very clear. So will the Cabinet Secretary be taking steps to realign government resources away from the manufacture of grievance and division and instead direct it towards delivering practical priorities to address the climate emergency? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, we always uh, deploy staff within the civil service to make sure we take forward our areas of policy priority. And that's why Scotland's emissions are down by well over 50% on the 1990 baseline, uh, which takes us over halfway and, of course, has us ahead of other parts of the UK in addressing uh, climate change. And what I can assure the member is that we will continue to take forward a range of policies to tackle the issue of climate change to ensure we do so in a fair and just way. And I would gently point out to the member we certainly won't tackle climate change effectively if we're opening up new coal mines. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Climate Change Committee report recognises key policy areas, for example, in industry and electricity supply sectors are reserved to the UK Government. So to what extent is meeting our net zero targets here in Scotland reliant on decisions taken by the UK Government? And how is the Scottish Government working with the UK Government to ensure that our ambition in Scotland are matched by the rest of the UK? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, there's a, a range of areas that, of course, are the responsibility of the Scottish Government, and we take them seriously and pursue policies to make sure we deliver on our climate change, our statutory climate change targets. But there are also areas which are reserved to the UK Government that have a direct impact on climate change policy here in Scotland. In the energy sector in particular, for example, negative emission technologies play an extremely important part in helping to make sure we meet our climate change targets here in Scotland and actually across the whole of the UK, which is why taking forward carbon capture and the ACORN project is mission critical, not only to Scotland's climate change targets, but also to the UK's climate change targets. And any further delay in making a decision about supporting something like CCUS and the ACORN project just creates uncertainty risk around employment, a lack of investment in key areas and places a greater burden in other policy areas, which is why we need the UK Government to step up to the plate and show leadership in this area and give the go-ahead to the ACORN project here in Scotland. Mercedes Bialba. Very grateful to the presiding officer for taking the question. If we are to meet our national target of reducing car mileage by 20% by 2030, reliable, affordable and readily available public transport will be key. One of the Climate Change Committee's recommendations to achieving this is to invest in sustainable forms of transport, yet the Scottish Government is proposing widespread service cuts to Scotland's railway. So will the Minister think again and rule out service reductions to demonstrate his Government's commitment to Scotland's railway to protect jobs and to reduce transport emissions. Cabinet Secretary. Absent officer, I do recognise that access to good public transport is an important part of helping to get people out of their cars into public transport, which is why we've been making significant investment in our railways in order to decarbonise them. We're now at the point where I think over 75% of all journeys on Scotland's railways are actually in electrified routes, uh, which has been decarbonised as a result of the investment this government has made, and why we've made significant significant investment in helping to decarbonise the bus system by actually investing in through grant schemes to support the electrification of the bus network through um, el electric buses which are now being rolled out. And I'm sure the member would also recognise we're now at the point where almost 50 per cent of people in Scotland actually travel on our bus network for free as a result of the concession travel scheme that we have for those that are over 60 and for those that are under 22. I'm sure the member would welcome that as an example of showing leadership and encouraging people onto our public transport network. Thank you. We're moving on to question four. I'd appreciate concise questions and responses. And I call Michelle Thompson. To ask the Scottish Government what steps are being taken to reduce bladder cancer deaths. Minister Marie Todd. Bladder cancer mortality uh, reduced by 14% over the period 2010 to 2020, and we are committed to continuing to improve this. As outlined in our endoscopy and urology diagnostic recovery and renewal plan, we will refresh and implement once for Scotland's clinical pathways to prioritise demand for 
cystoscopy, apologies, including bladder cancers. We have also introduced six urology hubs in Scotland. These hubs provide rapid access to diagnostic procedures to enable earlier cancer diagnosis and treatment. Michelle Thompson. I thank the Minister for her response. Bladder cancer is one of the highest mortality rates of all cancers, currently around 50%. It also has a high rate of reoccurrence, making it one of the most expensive cancers to treat fully. With Scotland's ageing population, it will likely result in longer-term, more complex treatments. To that end, could the Minister confirm what funding has been made available specifically for research into bladder cancer, including treatment of the disease and data gathered to enable correlative research? Minister. The funding schemes supported by the Scottish Government's Chief Scientist Office, the CSO, provide opportunities for applied health research across a whole range of health challenges, including bladder cancer. Applications are assessed through independent expert review, with funding decisions based on the recommendations of independent expert committees. They would be very happy to consider any applications for research into bladder cancer. CSO also contributes financially to a range of National Institute for Health and Care research funding schemes, which are open to applications from researchers in Scotland. And in addition, CSO invests through NHS Research Scotland in a cancer research network to support the delivery of studies in this area. Finally, Briefly, our, Minister. Finally, our National Cancer Quality Programme has developed a qual quality performance indicators, QPIs, for bladder cancer, first published in November 21, and it is encouraging that targets relating to 30- and 90-day mortality rates indicate a good performance. Thank you. Question number five, Willie Rennie. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what it is doing to support young people's mental health services, including in colleges and universities. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, Presiding officer, the Scottish Government continues to provide record funding in mental health services to ensure that all children and young people have access to the right mental health support at the right time. This includes continued investment in improving CAM services, funding 230 new and enhanced community supports and services for children, young people and their families, and providing access to counselling services for all secondary school, school pupils. In addition, we have exceeded our commitment to deliver 80 additional counsellors in further and higher education, with 89 additional counsellors now working to support students across institutions. Willie Rennie. If, if that's the case, I'm flummoxed as to why the government is even considering cutting those very mental health counsellors that he just described in colleges and universities at the end of this academic year. Now, I can remind him that two-thirds of college students report having low well-being and more than half report moderate to severe symptoms of depression. If that's the case, why is it when students need their help that the government's withdrawing the support of the very people that were designed to give them the help? Minister. Um, President officer, as I said in my previous answer, we have exceeded uh, the 80 councillors uh, that we uh, planned for with 89. Uh, and the student mental health plan, which is being taken forward by the Student Mental Health and Wellbeing Working Group and will sit alongside the Scottish Government's uh, forthcoming mental health and wellbeing strategy, will inform uh, the Scottish Government's future approach to student mental health and wellbeing. Uh, upon publication in spring of 2023, it will provide the framework for institutional action on this issue. And as part of this, officials will work with the universities and colleges sectors to move to a position where they fund elements of student mental health support, including counsellors, as part of their core offer to students. Thank you. Question six was withdrawn. Question seven not lodged. I call Richard Leonard at question eight. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it expects the replacement booking system for CalMac to be fully operational. Minister Jenny Gilruth. CalMac's new booking system, Arturus, is expected to go live across all CalMac routes in the spring of 2023. I am extremely disappointed that there has been a delay in the introduction of our tourists, which I do not think is acceptable. My officials in Transport Scotland have engaged with CalMac and have been informed that it will be operational by this spring. I will be meeting CalMac next week to seek further assurances to that end. The benefits of our tourists include better live deck space management for the use of capacity, 
better communication around disruption, a standardised, accessible, digitally enabled service, both online and apps, uh, as a means to purchase tickets and also to apply any changes instantly. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that rep reply? But the problem that the Minister has got is this. The project started as far back as August 2016. More than five years on, in December 2021, we were told by the government it would be completed and operational by February 2022. In July 2022, we were told it would be completed and operational by November 2022. Then just last month, on the 8th of December, we were told that it would go live in the spring, but 11 days later, on the 19th of December, we were told it would not be operational now until November 2023. Don't Scotland's islanders, dependent on lifeline services, working in fragile economies, deserve an explanation, deserve urgent action, and don't they deserve a lot more honesty from this government? Minister. I will provide Mr Leonard with an honest response and I hope he heard in my initial response my own disappointment and my own commitment to seek further assurances from CalMAC in relation to the repeated delays on the introduction of the system. But it is absolutely important and vital, I think, for islanders that we get the implementation of the new system right for Scotland's island communities. Now, CalMAC have advised my officials in Transport Scotland that their user acceptance testing has highlighted a number of issues that have been uh, anticipated given the complexity of the number of routes that CalMAC serves. It is really important those issues are addressed before the system is launched and its supplier has been working to address those issues. The member will also understand that I require to have confidence as Minister that this new system is going to work for islanders and for visitors to our islands alike. To that end, I will continue to work with CalMAC on achieving that cast iron assurance to ensure this new system will deliver the improvements that passengers and islanders need to see. Thank you. That concludes general questions.